join me in the opening prayer? Eternal God, by our Son, you led mankind to the worship of your Son. Guide the nations of the earth by your life, that the whole world may see your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Tuesday afternoon. Um, she did have major abdominal surgery and of course that's a, a slow recovery and so she is at home and is recovering. Um, I will be uh, on duty uh, through the next couple of weeks but probably working at home but the most I can working at home uh, to be with her. She's not able to bend or lift or do any of that, that good stuff and so she'll need me to do that for her uh, during this time. Uh, she did her, her situation was life threatening, uh, but that has been corrected uh, by the surgery. But of course, now we have the rover recovery from the surgery, uh, and that's going to be a bit long. Uh, but we're very happy um, to have had the surgery and have that behind us and, and, and be on the road to recovery. I want to thank all of you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dan and Jessica who filled in on the 18th, and Norman who filled in. Uh, for Christmas Eve or at Christmas Day. Um, our our um, hospital stay encompassed both our 23rd anniversary and Christmas. Um, so that was that was interesting. Um, and I told Heather, I said, with the preaching you guys had here over the last couple of weekends, I need to get back to work while I still have a job. Um, so there's some competition now. Uh, so anyway, I appreciate all of you and all of your support. Uh, we received many uh, many well wishes uh, on social media and otherwise, and, and food and, and some other things. Um, I'm capable of cooking, 
but if you do want to send food, you know, that's fine. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you for all of your support and all of your prayers. We felt all of them. Um, this has been an ordeal uh, for Heather and for I and for our family. Uh, but we appreciate all of your, your support and, and mostly uh, your, your flexibility. This has always been a very flexible, resilient congregation. Your flexible, flexibility and resiliency and grace in allowing me to, to divide my time and, and be with, with her and with my family during this time. I appreciate all of you more than you can ever know. Uh, moving on to announcements. Um, I do want to announce that um, we are going to be resuming after this week our, our normal um, schedule, our post-holiday schedule. Um, you'll find that in your bulletin. Uh, Thursday morning Bible study is coming back uh, this week while it's coming back. Uh, next week, Eagles and Ivories and Jazz Sunday is coming up, um, so be aware of that. Also be aware that the single service on the 22nd, uh, 10 o'clock for Jazz Sunday, and then uh, Valentine boxes, all those, those things starting up that we do in the winter are coming upon us, so please uh, mark your calendars uh, with all of, all of those things. Um, and now, let us worship God with the gifts that we have brought. Bless the givers and the gifts and those who have not to give. 
Use our gifts and us to do your work in the world, to spread your gospel throughout the earth, and to bring glory to your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, for this song, uh, I will be the light tonight along with this half the congregation, and the choir will be the bold tonight along with that half the congregation, and I will sing the response together. So let's pray. Dear God, Dear God, thank you that you are bringing people to Jesus. Thank you that you are bringing people to Jesus. In so many different ways. In so many different ways. And help 
help us to pay attention to the ways you are calling us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. Listen to the word of God. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth of the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land. Young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense proclaiming the praise of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Again, listen to the word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and had come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them whether the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. Excuse me. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no, not, no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Jerusalem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of God. For the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, welcome to the season of Epiphany and our Epiphany series, A Light, the Nations. Epiphany doesn't actually start officially until January 6th, but uh, we Methodists don't typically have those midweek services uh, like some other traditions, so we kind of shift things to the, to the nearest Sunday. And so uh, this for us is Epiphany Sunday. Epiphany uh, means revealing. It means discovering. It, it is the aha moment when you realize uh, the truth about something uh, that you had not yet fully understood. And so uh, this year, for Epiphany, we're talking about all light to the nations as we see in, in the book of Isaiah. 
And in amongst all of our pending readings this year, what I'm going to try to get at is that Jesus is for everybody. The great aha moment it, for us this year is going to be that Jesus is for everybody. He is a global savior. He is a world savior. He is not a Jewish savior or even an American savior. He is the savior of the whole world, every tribe, tongue, and nation. As I said in our Thanksgiving service, we had our Thanksgiving Eve service we had here uh, just before uh, Thanksgiving. I, I, I quoted this every tribe, tongue, and nation scripture, and I said, I'm not saying uh, that you can't go to heaven if you're a racist because I God can forgive everything. What I'm saying is, if you're a racist, you won't like it there. Because it is a place of every tribe and every tongue and every nation where every barrier between human beings is broken down. And that's what I'm going to try to get at during the season of Epiphany. The wisdom of the wise men then is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that the nations, all the nations, would come to the light. The wisdom of the wise men is the first indication that we have that Jesus is not just a Jewish savior. See, that's what everybody else would have thought until the wise men show up. As a matter of fact, I think that's what that's what maybe maybe John the Baptist's father had a bit of an inclination when you read his uh, Benedictus. I think that John the Baptist himself had an inclination when he said that Jesus was the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the whole world. I think Mary knew, Mary knew, if that's a question. Mary knew, and we heard it in her Magnificat that Jesus would be a savior for the whole world, but everybody else thought the Messiah was going to come and was going to handle Jewish business primarily, particularly business around evicting the Roman occupation from Jerusalem. But in come the wise men. And the wise men were about as non-Jewish as one could get. The wise men were about as non-Jewish as one could get. See, they were foreigners. They were from the land of Persia, modern-day Iran. They were from the, the land in which the, the Jews had been taken captive in Babylon. They were from that area of the world. So they were foreigners. They were pagans. They worshipped idols. They worshipped what for the Jewish people were false gods. And they were astrologers. They were people who looked at the stars to understand the difference between now we understand the difference between astronomy and astrology. Astronomy is the study, scientific study of the, the celestial world, uh, but, but uh, astro astrology, of course, is the use of, of the stars to predict the future and, and, and have guidance and all that kind of thing. But there was a difference back then. They were astrologers. They looked at the stars for signs. They looked for the stars for guidance. They looked for the stars to predict the future, to make decisions. And that, of course, was forbidden in Jewish custom. Now, of course, you know I'm a Cancer, and you all know what that means. Nothing. It means nothing. Right along with Myers Briggs and Enneagram and all that other stuff that's supposed to tell you who you are. Um, the Bible tells me who I am. I'm a redeemed child of God. That's all you really need to know about me. Oh, I'm a sinner too, by the way. Um, but, but here are these astrologers. But to me, the amazing thing, the amazing thing about this, this story, because this is just packed with meaning, but to me, the amazing thing about this story is that God used what they already knew to bring them to the light of Christ. God used what they already knew to bring them to the light of Christ. God didn't reject their astrology. He redeemed it. He used that to bring them to Jesus. And throughout history, the church has gone from best, and the gospel has spread fastest, where we have incorporated and reinterpreted re culture wherever we could, rather than try to replace it. Let me say that again. 
that none of them are amen. It's just a complicated sentence, so I want to say it again so you get it. Um, throughout history, the church has grown fast, the gospel has spread fastest, where we have incorporated and we interpreted culture wherever we could, rather than try to replace it. So there's, there's some things, as, as, as missionaries entered culture, there were some things in that culture that simply couldn't be aligned with, um, with, uh, with the Christian gospel. Right? There's just some things that couldn't be reinterpreted, right? Um, and, and as, as one missiologist said, you know, when, when, when missionaries arrived on, a, on an island of cannibals, you know, that's one of the things that had to go because you can't love your neighbor and eat him. <laughs> but, but there's lots of places where, where things can be reinterpreted. Think about Paul on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 when he's coming to the book of Acts. How he used the pagan poets, the Greek pagan poets, to bring people to Christ. Um, in Northern Europe, which is where most of us, as I look across this room, most of us look to be fairly Northern European, with a few exceptions. But but in Northern Europe, the the missionaries would not tear down the pagan temples, but rather they would rededicate them to Christ. And yes, and yes, friends. There's a lot of Northern European paganism in our modern celebration of Christmas. But there's a lot more of Victorian England, quite frankly, in our celebration of Christmas. And a lot more North American commercialism in our celebration of Christmas. But understand that that was reincorporating all of those things that people loved about their own culture and bringing it into the church rather than rejecting it. We would have done well in, in, in remembering those lessons from the early church in the 18th century, at, or 19th century, as the gospel spread to many of the Pacific Islands. As, as missionaries came to some of these Pacific Islands, um, they, they were under the assumption that to be a Christian, one had to dress like a Christian. You know, wool suits and, and dresses and all of that. And so as they would, they would make converts of, so, so they, they go to the Pacific Islands and you know, you're talking about loincloths. I wouldn't want my loincloth today, but it's still a little cold for that. But they, they arrived on the islands and they said, no, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to dress like a Christian. In other words, you have to dress like a Northern European. And they dressed these natives in these wool clothes and, and um, as the tropical rains came in, the natives were used to just working out in the rain because, you know, that's what they did. Their clothes got wet and didn't dry. They caught pneumonia and died. Now, I want to say that dressing like a Christian doesn't mean dressing like a Northern European. So, We need to understand that there are some things that we can use and some things that we can't use. That's my point. And we need to enter into other cultures and the cultures of non-believers with respect for where they already are and what they already believe so that we can bring them as Paul did, bring them as the early church did, bring them as the very best missionaries today do into a relationship with Christ. Epiphany is about discovery. That's what epiphany means. It means to discover something, to realize something that you previously had not known. And this epiphany, we are going to discover that faith in Jesus, or that Jesus is a savior for every race, culture, and nation. We're going to discover again that Jesus is a savior for the whole world. Jesus is a light to the nations. Let us come <laughs> to the light. Let us pray. Dear God, we all know that there are many things that brought us here today. 
God, whether we have just begun a journey of faith or whether we have followed you for years, there was something that brought us. There was something that guided us. There was, there was an epiphany for us when we suddenly realized that it was real. Call it a star, call it an angel, call it whatever it was for us, a relationship, a parent, a spouse, a pastor, a friend. It might have been a point of desperation where we finally had nowhere else to turn but to you. But God, here we are. And none of us is here by accident, and none of us is here on our own. And so, God, we have followed our various stars in this place today to a meeting with Jesus, the light of the world, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Savior of every tribe, tongue, and nation. God, help us to remember that. And God, as we have followed our star here today, God, send us out into the world to be a star for someone else that will lead them to their Savior. God, we pray for this church. We pray that you bless us and help us to grow and prosper. Help us to worship and serve you in spirit and in truth and serve the world in your name. God, we pray for the whole body of Christ throughout the world. We pray for the persecuted church. We pray for the United Methodist Church, for this annual conference in our Bishop Geneva, this district and our superintendent Doug. We pray for our community, our nation, our world in these troubled times. We pray for all the people and places who are in need throughout the world today. God, we pray for all of those that are sick and suffering. We pray for men and women who serve us at home and abroad, for our military, for our veterans, for our law enforcement, our first responders, for our missionaries and our relief workers, and our health care workers, and all those that serve our community. We pray for our world leaders at every level. We pray for our government, our economy, and our environment. God, we pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and the whole world for blessings of peace, justice, health safety, freedom, stability, prosperity, and holiness. And now, O oh God, we pray that you hear the prayers of each and every heart that is worshiping with us this morning, either in person or online. As we offer up our prayers to you, either silently or aloud, say, in Jesus' name, Amen. Loving God, you've heard our prayers here this morning and hear the prayers that remain silent upon our hearts. Oh God, you know our every need, and when we do not know how to pray, your spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. God, we pray that you hear us now as we lift up our voices together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe. 
seen in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under conscious fire, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we come in communion this morning, just a few words of instruction. Uh, if you're new with, to us, uh, please come down the center aisle, and I will offer you a to go ahead and receive that. As you step to either side, um, you'll, you'll, the server will offer you a cup, and then there are waste baskets on either end uh, for, to, to be place that empty cup, and then return to your seats uh, by the side aisles. If you are a guest with us today, I want to let you know, and I'll say it in a moment more formally, but uh, we practice open communion. That is, all that come to the table will be served uh, today. Um, dear friends, the United Methodist Church practices open communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all those who truly love him, all those who earnestly repent of their sins, all those who seek to live in peace with one another. And young children are welcome to participate at the discretion of their parents. Therefore, let us prepare ourselves to receive this holy sacrament by confessing and repenting of our sins in silence. So I would say that gluten free wafers are available for those who need that. I'll just indicate that when you come up. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth, from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth light on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Christ was born, 
and in your signs and witnesses in every age and through all the world, you have led your people from far places to his life. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Friends, all is ready, all are welcome. Come to the table.
This prayer is known as the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer, although Wesley didn't write it. Um, it was used from very early on in Methodist societies as part of covenant renewal services that took place on uh, January 1st of each year as prayer form the core of that service. And it's a prayer that I pray and many Methodists pray every day, and I commend it to you for that, but today we'll use it as our prayer after communion. It is our own. I am no longer my own, but I put me to what thou wilt, grant me with whom thou wilt, put me to doing, put me to suffering, let me be employed by thee, or lay aside for thee, exalted for thee, or allow no for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things for thy pleasure and soul. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am mine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, that every man of mine be present. Amen. Amen. Receive this benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Let us go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Experiencing grace, exploring truth, expressing love.